This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So this is actually a 30-year journey, 35 even. In 1978, uh, our teacher Thomas Berry, who was an extraordinary cultural historian of world religions and especially of Asia and of native uh, peoples and so on, wrote this very small little essay called The New Story. And he was suggesting at that time, after many, many years of studying human cultures and civilizations, um, that we needed something that would bring us together uh, for the planet because he was very prescient about what was already happening to the environment and so on. So he felt we needed to bring science and evolution and ecology and so on together with the humanities, uh, which again is what environmental humanities is trying to do here, to bring the sense of story, bring English, history, literature, poetry, music, and so on. In other words, we filter things through ourselves and through the humanities in particular. So we had science over here, um, kind of a nova kind of science science, but we had never told this story as a whole. So it's kind of like this pearl necklace, if you will, taking the best of contemporary science, because what has exploded in one century in terms of our knowledge is really extraordinary. I mean, it took 50 years for Wegener's notion of plate tectonics to actually be accepted by scientists. Um, again, you know, the notion that there were only two galaxies in the universe as opposed to a trillion galaxies. So how could we take obviously not all of this knowledge, but bring forward something that would be coherent, um, that would be exciting, and that would also encourage all of us to explore aspects of this universe that um, just saturated with extraordinary processes of which, you know, from the microscope to the telescope, give us glimpses of, of processes that we're only understanding in a, in a small way. So, just to kind of finish um, the narration, uh, response to your question, in, um, for, for about 10 years, Brian Swim, who himself is part native from the uh, Salish River peoples in uh, British Columbia, so his father um, has that whole lineage, and then he did his science degree and so on. So he and Thomas Berry worked for 10 years to write the universe story, uh, which came out in 92. And that was the first time this was told in a book form. And this is the first time it's told in a film form. There'll be other tellings of this and exciting narrations and using other parts of the story for sure. Um, and there'll be forms of this in music. There was an oratorio done last year up in Vermont uh, for Journey of the Universe. A thousand people came. It was really amazing. So the story needs to be told in many, many different forms. And as I said, I think at the beginning, we spent about 10 years uh, making this film, writing the script, writing the book, uh, doing the interviews with scientists and so on. Um, the book is in now about, it came out, th this all came out about three years ago. And there's translations in French and Italian, Korean, uh, the Chinese, Russian, and Turkish. The film is in Spanish. Um, I'll take it to Korea this summer. Uh, the book's in Korean, and the film will be in Korea. So we're also trying to say this is a planetary story, and different parts of the world will pick this up in their own way. We've shown it in China, and there's been a really quite remarkable response there as well. Other questions? It's a long narration of the long story. Um, so um, there's a kind of a common notion that, uh, well, humanity could die off and the planet would be fine. We just are kind of these leeches and, and everything else will go on without us. And I, um, I believe, and maybe I heard this from Brian Swim, but I know there's also another notion that I think what Brian might have said was something like, 
the universe loves us appreciating it or something along those lines. But there's an idea that uh, we are integrally related and the, the universe does depend on us as well. It's not explicit in this film, but there's a, a vague suggestion. I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit on that. Yeah, that's a, a big question t uh, too and a good one. So I think what you're referring to at one point, uh, Brian says when he's in the little taverna at the very beginning and showing the balloon, if we expanded or contracted, you know, we had just the right uh, energy and timing to create, have this unfolding universe, which is in itself is pretty amazing. So that idea that the expansion rate was just right, uh, kind of like the Goldilocks effect, some people call it, um, is, has led to what's being called an anthropic principle. And that means that, as he, he cites Freeman Dyson, who's at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, and Freeman Dyson said, in some way, the universe must have known we were coming, life was coming, um, and eventually human life. So there's a notion among scientists and others to say that the conditions for life were just so, um, and that eventually, as we say in the film, life emerges. So this takes the anthropic principle and just illustrates those conditions, the temperature, and again, the, the sense that we're in this so-called huge cell. So the atmosphere uh, has adapted itself to life and so on. So we can get, there's a strong anthropic principle, you know, it was definitely that humans were gonna come or a weak one. So it's a very interesting kind of theory that, that has a number of branches to it. But the idea is basically the conditions for the expansion of the universe were just right, and then the conditions for life were such that it emerged over billions of years. I mean, the first cell, it took a billion years just for that to emerge, and multi-cells, another, another billion, so two billion, you know, for just the first cells. And where did they come from? You know, we, the deep sea vents is a possibility from meteors and outside comets and, and whatnot. But so that's an interesting whole you know, theory of this miracle, really, of life. Now you're also saying, I think on the other side, um, well, life will continue even without humans, uh, and are we part of the problem or are we destructive species and so on, if, if I'm picking up what I think you were saying. So we have these two huge possibilities, right? A choice between saying we are participating in something vast, huge, and are we aligning ourselves with that? That image at the end on the boat with the wheel turning, that's kind of, here's the alignment, you know, that we, we need to think about. Almost every film showing has this question, are we gonna destroy ourselves? Now, that question wouldn't have even occurred to our parents. So I think the fact that we are thinking about this question, it's not just other species that are going extinct. You know, what does it mean to go in one century from two billion to six billion people? Everything changes. So I think you can see where I would come out on the question, uh, but that's what we're asking. What are the choices here? I think some other people are having questions too. Yeah, I think this is a really r r remarkable synthesis of of just a vast, <laughs> vast subject. Uh, I'm, I'm, it seems like the logical, but I, what I see is a synthesis of science and humanities, the natural sciences and the humanities, but the big next question will involve really the social sciences and economics and sociology, and to what extent are those disciplines also engaged in this dialogue? Yeah. That's a great question. So that's also why we did the, so it's a film and a book, um, sort of in the genre of Lauren Isley with this poetic sensibility. But then we also did this series of interviews with scientists, and so about 10 scientists who are telling their part of the story with an excitement that they see it now too as an epic story, uh, not just you know, s narrowing down on their discipline. But the other 10 are environmentalists. Um, I interviewed uh, 
Richard Norgard, who's one of the founders of ecological economics at Berkeley, uh, great, great thinker in this. We, we did all these conferences at Harvard, actually trying to integrate, integrate the religions with economics, with science and policy and so on. Um, so there's no question that we're also in dialogue with people from economics and policy. I teach at a school of forestry and environmental studies, which is a policy-based school for the environment. I'm teaching a course right now, actually, with the professor at the law school, who's the environmental lawyer on law, environment, and religion. So policy, economics, law are absolutely critical. But people from those disciplines, I'm not suggesting economics <laughs> necessarily, but People, Gus Beth, who was our former dean at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, brought us to the school as the first humanities people because he said he founded NRDC, National Resources Defense Council, the first legal arm for the environment. He founded World Resources Institute, Great Policy Institute in Washington. But he said science and policy and law aren't enough because they become technocratic and we need something more. And a lot of people in law uh, and, and so on feel that. So, but it's crucial, especially for an ecological economics to come forward. That was a great movie. And um, I feel like uh, overpopulation is a great source of the problems that humanity faces today. And I feel like your movie kind of alluded to that. Would you care to share your opinions on that? Well, I think um, most when I give a talk, I usually begin by saying we went from two billion to six billion in one century, as I said a moment ago, and that has changed everything. Um, you know, I'm a student of China, and I've been going to Asia for 40 years this month, February 1973, so even more of, uh, than 40 years. But watching what's happened, in China and India are gonna change the face of the planet, right? You've got a billion, more than a billion people in each of those places. So population is the driver of resource extraction, mining, the destruction of fisheries and forests and so on all over the place. The tar sands in China, uh, sorry, the tar sands in Canada are going to go to China fundamentally. China is devouring Africa in an imperialist move far greater than anything the European powers ever imagined. So Yet China was one of the first to come up with a policy, right, on this, and got all kinds of pushback at the UN and from our own government and whatnot. So I think this is such, it's a complicated issue. It's essential that we talk about it, for sure. It's essential that we get better policies on it. But the UN is very fascinating because what they did not realize was the empowerment of women education of women and better health care uh, for women actually has changed the, st the statistics significantly. So that's one of the things we really need to encourage around the world, uh, education, health care, and so on, for both men and women, obviously, but the empowerment of women, women is essential in this. So big topic, really important topic, yeah. Thank you so much for the wonderful film. It was really uh, inspiring, and I love the thought of the idea of this continuity. Uh, it seems to me that this movie is um, not just about the history of nature, but also about the structure of knowledge. And so this is related to two questions ago. And I guess I wonder, you know, thinking about the ways in which you made all these connections, the metaphors you used, uh, just connecting the dots in all these different ways, and really blurring the lines between the traditional disciplines and the way you did. I'm wondering if you've received any uh, pushback or misgivings from some people who themselves have spent a lot of time patrolling those boundaries between the disciplines? That's a beautifully phrased question, especially patrolling the boundaries. <laughs> Thank you. And um, only we who live embedded in academic institutions can uh, really appreciate that, though, as Susan and Ken assured me at dinner, you see Santa Barbara is way ahead of the game in terms of interdisciplinarity and we at Yale and have to really catch up, frankly. You know, I think we're very siloed into disciplines, mostly across the academic world. So I think your question is terrific because um, we are trying to say in this film, there are multiple ways of knowing. 
And we have privileged science and engineering, very much so. And the Chinese have privileged science and engineering, hugely, so that my great professor at Harvard, Duwei Ming, a immensely effective professor of Confucianism, was invited to go back to China to set up a humanities center at Beijing University precisely to counter this, okay? And this is why I think environmental humanities are such a breakthrough, because humanities have been swept to the side. Even at Yale, which has a great humanities tradition, they feel besieged by, oh, we've got to go towards STEM, we have to go towards science, and, and so on and so forth. I'm like, get out of your corner, and do environmental humanities. And we have discovered 62 classes at, at Yale in environmental humanities and so on. So this is a very exciting and important direction, but why? Because it also represents a robust and exciting counterpoint to a hierarchy of knowledge that has buried us, frankly, absolutely buried us. Talk about a two-world culture, you know, C.P. Snow. We are staggering in schizophrenia because we have not put this together. The thrill of science, that every scientist I know is motivated by wonder and awe, you see. And that's what this is trying to bring together. We're all motivated by wonder and awe and beauty. And beauty is what's going to inspire us, not fear, not the sad bad news which we're drowning in. But this is trying to say very fundamentally multiple ways of knowing, and they can be synergized in new genres and new forms are essential. So thank you for that question. Yeah. If uh, we're kind of on a course almost in the development, you know, the, from the Big Bang to now and so forth, but uh, if, if this is almost a, a process taking place and it's a, uh, you know, let's say it's an event that, that, that has a lot of, you know, potential problems and so forth, but is it almost forcing the next step where we're all in this together? You know, we're, I mean, you're talking about China, you talk about India, and it's not like just one little country or whatever can, can solve this, and if, if it isn't done you know, on this little planet of ours with everyone, uh, you know, there there isn't going to be really a change. I, I was just thinking, I mean, I, I don't know much about any of this here. I've, I've been in the building business forever and did many, many high-rise buildings in Honolulu. But, um, you know, I know in, I don't know, what is it, the 70s or whatever, uh, Claire Patterson, do you know who, who that is? No, well, he, he was the one that took ice cores and found out that they're, mm -hmm. You know, there's more and more lead in the atmosphere, right. and it, it continued to increase. And because of that, then uh, I think, you know, lead was put in gasoline just to, for anti-knock and so forth, you know. But, um, you know, that lead actually, uh, <laughs> that led to taking out lead and gasoline in the United States, and I think all over the world. So, so what was potentially uh, uh, very harmful to us, you know, in the end was... Uh, was dealt with, but I'm just wondering if all of what's going on here now is, and it's, it may take, you know, many generations, I don't know, but may, maybe in a way it's a transformation again, part of a transfer, transformative process, but I any thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and uh, it would even go back to, you know, why we made the movie. I think Thomas Berry had this notion we are definitely in a moment of transition, some people are actually calling this the great transi transition or the great transformation. Joanna Macy up in Berkeley and uh, Paul Raskin on the East Coast has a whole institute on the great transformation of this moment. So that's why the term Anthropocene has gotten a lot of traction because it's saying we're shutting down this last 10 to 12,000 years. But uh, by a species extinction, by our presence around the planet, like an octopus uh, around the planet. But Barry had an even larger framework of this, and he would say, um, as we do in the film, we are shutting down the Cenozoic period, which is the even larger geological age of the from the beginning of the dinosaurs. So the last great extinction, there's been five great extinctions. We're in the midst of a sixth extinction, but the last one was the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, no doubt with a meteor into the Yucatan Peninsula and so on. So he would say, 
we're at the end of the Cenozoic era, and we are beginning to shape or create the foundations for an Ecozoic era. Um, and he would say, and I think we all agree, that it's on that scale of largeness in terms of time that we need to think about it. So there's two, two points. One is we do have to, I think, feel this is going to be a long transition. It's not going to happen in our lifetimes, but we plant the trees <laughs> for future generations kind of thing. Um, this will take hundreds of years, actually, to come to some sense, I would like to say, not just sustainability, a sustainable future, but a flourishing future for the well-being of humans and all species and all generations into the future. And that's why this, I mean, I'm in California, we have to talk about a change of consciousness, right? <laughs> I mean, this is the largest change of consciousness that humans have ever been invited into. And that is what's exciting. That is what is really exciting. And Barry would say, we have a great work to do so that those of you who are studying, you, you're gaining certain tools and, and specializations to contribute to this transformation. And if we see this in a larger way, it means everything, every effort matters. Um, I'm so happy that my brother Paul Tucker and his wife Maggie are here, and Maggie was saying as we were going over, you know, LA used to be much more smoggy, and even in 20 years and so on, it's less smoggy. So we've made a lot of progress, um, but we have to really be thinking, and just to sort of conclude, we have to be thinking as a planetary species for the whole planet. I mean, when I went to Japan in 73, 74, I talked on the phone once, and that's when Paul and Maggie were married. That was the only phone call I had uh, in two years of being there teaching at a university. Think of where we are now. It's amazing. It's totally amazing. And maybe we can sort of conclude here, perhaps. Um, so let me say why I remain hopeful. And it's, it's largely because of students, their resilience, their sense of they can contribute, the students that Yale are extraordinary against great odds and they have great creativity. But here's also why I remain, I would say, hopeful in, or, or that we're trying to generate the gateways towards hope because that's a huge, huge possibility, you know. But my grandfather um, taught history at Columbia um, and he was a European historian and he was trying to get the department there to move beyond American history and say, we have to know European history, right? He tried to study the causes of the two world wars and nationalism and understanding what the nation state, what the limits of the nation state um, really are. And then his student, Ted DeBerry, went off to the Second World War and he and a whole generation came back to Columbia and elsewhere and set up some of the greatest Asian studies programs literally in the world. They are fabulous at many of these universities. I'm sure right here, I know you've got strong Asian studies. I was a student of his, of Ted DeBerry, who was a student of my grandfather's. And by the way, our understanding of Asia came out of the, the Second World War. It's when they learned the languages, when they came back and did the translations of these texts and history. There was no Asian studies, you know, 60 years ago virtually in the universities here. That's amazing when you think about it. So when I came out of Columbia, I started teaching in a history department and I had to teach world history. Totally crazy, I learned a lot, I can tell you. But world history was just emerging and it's a requirement in a lot of the high schools even now. And my brother Carlton, University High School up in San Francisco got very involved in world history and it was a great coalition of high school and college teachers. So the final phase of this in one generation, you could say, or a couple generations, is what's being called big history. And it's, they had a conference in the Bay Area this uh, past summer. It's universe, earth, uh, and human history as one dynamic whole. And it's exploding, uh, big history. So it's part of who we are, coming back to my first points. Where do we place ourselves? We place ourselves in the largest story 
ever told, this epic of evolution. And I think by doing that, we'll get the energy for the work that needs to be done, kind of the inspiration for the perspiration of the transformation on the ground, if you will. Thank you very, very much for coming tonight.